Hey, everybody, this is Chris and Kathy from Petability Podcast. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to Petability Podcast through your favorite streaming app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Petability Podcast and share our content on social media. You can also support the show by making a donation. Simply go to our website at petabilitypodcast.buzzsprout.com and click on the heart symbol at the top of the page. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Hello, Kathy. How are you? Hi, Chris. I'm doing pretty darn good today. Having well, a good day. I, I am too, but the weather is a little bit, mm, shall we say, crisp, damp. Yeah. And I'm feeling a little bit of stiffness, maybe a little bit of inflammation because he has a little bit of arthritis. Well, I think that's a fantastic segue because today we're going to talk about inflammation. <laughs> and inflammation is, is, is fascinating really because there's good inflammation, right? There's inflammation that is your friend because they're going to help. It's going to help you after an injury, but there's inflammation that's bad. And that's your frenemy. The inflammation that's bad, the chronic drawn out inflammation is bad. So why don't we uh, go right in and talk about what inflammation is? Sure. And I think a lot of our listeners probably never thought of inflammation as good as a natural process that has to occur in the body to promote healing. So hopefully we'll dispel yeah. some some myths about that. And uh, like you said, kind of d- make a distinction between what's good inflammation and necessary and, and for ultimate health and what is bad inflammation. Right. And, and when you think of good inflammation, I probably never hear anybody ever call inflammation good, but it is true. It's the body's natural response to things that could harm it, right? So those things could be injury, they could be infection, they could be virus, they could be bacterial. So it's not just injury, um, but the body's going to release these white blood cells and the white blood cells is going to release this chemical. And that chemicals, those are your warriors. Those are the ones that are going to go and clean up um, dead cells, waste, and, and, and those times are often um, sort of acute. It usually happen pretty quickly, right? And it, mm-hmm. it doesn't hang around too long, the inflammation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the amount of, you know, cell damage in an injury or, you know, the the amount of inflammation, if you will. So, you know, in these COVID times that, that we've been dealing with for almost two years now, you know, that's the thing. This virus, this coronavirus sets off this huge cascade of inflammation which in its initial stages primarily was attacking the lungs and the respiratory system. So that's why, you know, the ventilators and, you know, that it's airborne and all that, that stuff. So, you know, inflammation can be bad when it's, when it goes overboard. And that's certainly the case with right. COVID. And it's interesting, you know, like we, you just talked about how this, the coronavirus causes inflammation in the lungs. And I think if you think about inflammation in the body, it could happen. It could happen anywhere. You could have inflammation from a twisted ankle. You could have inflammation in your lungs. You could have inflammation in your joints, your skin, Mm -hmm. uh, your mouth. So it can occur in, in almost any part of your body, really. Right. And again, I, I'm just, I'm not going to dwell on the whole COVID thing, but you know, when, when they do the screening questions, you know, they ask you about things like nausea, diarrhea, because this inflammation is also attacking the digestive tract, your right. gut. Right. And, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the various things, you know, that, that you mentioned, you know, gums, eyes, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, right. it's uh, again, a natural process, but it can occur anywhere. 
Right. And, and when we're talking about inflammation, um, you know, it, it happens not only to humans, but our dogs and our mm-hmm. cats and our birds and our guinea pigs and our rabbits. So they have the same uh, natural response to those types of uh, injuries or viruses or disease. Um, they, they, they experience inflammation like, like we right. experience inflammation. I think, right. I think any being that has an immune system has right. the potential for inflammation because it's that immune system that sends out the inflammatory cells and attacks the ready for it foreign invaders. <laughs> da, da, da. So that being again, your bacteria, right. your viruses, you know, and, and like those white blood cells cleaning up, you know, the, the damaged tissue and the things that shouldn't be there in the first place. So that's kind of like what we're talking about initially is this good inflammation. So you twist your ankle, it hurts, you swear, um, it starts to, you know, then the inflammation starts to come in. And um, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about the five stages, but that's when that acute inflammation happens. And so we want that response initially. We don't want that response to go on for, you know, days, weeks, months, and years. Right. But it should happen, you know, pretty, pretty instantaneously right after an injury um, very quickly. And it shouldn't hang around for too long. So, so there is that good inflammation and that's what we're talking about right now. Yes. And I think your example of an ankle sprain is, is excellent uh, I've always struggled in talking with clients to try to get them to picture inflammation. And that is definitely an example I'll give because I think everybody can relate to that, right? Like you said, it hurts. Yeah. So there's pain involved. And if it's bad enough, it swells up, right? right? And right. it may bruise or turn red. It feels warm to the touch and you're limping on it. So nice. that leads right in to the five signs of inflammation. So Kathy, if you say each sign, then I'm going to geek out and say the term in Latin because that brings me great joy. So um, one sign of inflammation is redness or rubor. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Um, another another um, sign of inflammation, swelling. Two more. Wow. <laughs> and, wow. Yeah. And then. Uh, another sign is uh, warmth, so things are warm to the touch. Calor. And pain. Dolor. And loss of function. I don't have a Latin translation for that. But basically, <laughs> it's not being able to, to move that body part easily. Yes. Or yes. like I s- said in the um, ankle sprain example, you know, you, you might be limping. But another yeah. way to, to picture inflammation, I think that this obvious is like if you cut yourself, Right. Right. So, I mean, not only is there bleeding and, um, but you know, there's pain, Mm -hmm. you know, that tissue around the cut. I mean, even if it's a hangnail, right, it gets so red along with that pain and it swells up like, you know, that cuticle gets all swollen and, and, you know, it may feel warm. Um, Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to tell sometimes, but this is a good reminder for people to use the back of their hand because that's a very sensitive uh, part of our bodies to feel warmth, you know, when you're feeling like for the fever, you know, you use the back of the hand, not that's the how moms touch. That's yes, how moms, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> on the forehead, not, not the uh, palm. So yeah. don't forget that. And then um, in terms of our hangnail example and the loss of function, I mean, how many, like, you don't even realize how much your, your pinky on your non-dominant hand is involved in daily activities until you get a hangnail. On that or finger, a splinter under your and, oh, yes. splinter. and then it's like it's it's involved in everything, and you, you you like can't even or don't want to use your hand because it hurts under the water. It hurts when you grip things. So that is again that acute inflammatory stage. Right. And I think that when you're thinking about animals, you know, um, when I think of those stages, except for the the loss of function, I think of animals when they first come out of like orthopedic surgery. Mm. You're going to see all you're going to see all those you know those those stages those symptoms. You're going to see redness and swelling. It's going to be warm to the touch and there's going to be some pain involved um, and there'll likely be some bruising. And that will go down as, mm-hmm. you know, as, as the dog uh, or cat progresses through their recovery. But you can see, you know, all the stages there when that dog first comes out from like TPLO surgery or having, you know, having their, their CCL repaired. And I think it's good to note here that it can be shocking. I mean, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. It can be super swollen, super yeah. bruised. The incision yeah. is oozing. I mean, it is definitely inflamed. Yeah. So yeah. fair warning there. Yeah. So Kathy, I loved in, in the introduction to this show that you use the term frenemy, and I've never heard that in relationship to inflammation, but I think it is perfect. Tell me you did that all on your own. This, you're not copying anybody. Yeah. No, it came up all in my head all by myself Wow! because I was thinking about inflammation yes. as, rehab, as rehabbers do. They just sit around thinking about inflammation. And, and it occurred to me, inflammation is your frenemy because on one hand you have good, the good inflammation like we talked about. And then we have inflammation that hangs around like bad company. You know, the guy who comes to your house wants to surf on your couch, but stays too long. Starts eating all your food, eating all your food. Then you feel depleted, you know, it's, it's, so Mm -hmm. they're kind of, you know, there's, they're, they're a little bit, you know, opposites here. You know, in one hand, you want to have that inflammation when you have an injury, that acute inflammation, um, but you don't want it to stick around and become chronic inflammation. Right. So in your, in your analogy there, I mean, you, you invite your friend over and, you know, it's, it's really fun for that first evening and, and, you know, maybe even going into the next day, you know, you have lots to talk about and, you know, you're having a good time and you're, you know, sharing a beer. And then it goes into, you know, maybe day three and four and you're like, okay, um, I'm really kind of getting annoyed here. This friend is just uh, hanging out a little too long for my comfort. And then you start thinking about, well, plotting. How am I going to get rid of this this right. said friend, you know, because now I'm getting resentful. Now yeah. this is really impacting my life. Listen, and chronic inflammation is definitely the guy who drinks all your beer and doesn't replace it. Like mm. that's the guy, but you're mm-hmm. right. You're plotting and thinking, this is so uncomfortable. How do I get out of this? And and how can I make this? How can I feel good again? How can I feel right. comfortable right. again? Right. And, and that's, and that's where, you know, we come in. I mean, we could talk about, you know, some of the, the ways that rehabbers, um, can help to facilitate the Mm -hmm. reduction of that inflammation, especially when it comes to, you know, structural inflammation, physical Mm -hmm. inflammation, if you will. So like you gave the example of, you know, post-op orthopedic surgery or your sprain strain, uh, your back pain, um, you know, so, so we use massage, We use gentle because you don't want to be aggressive with acute inflammation. We use ice, right? Cryotherapy. That's that's probably my first go-to move with inflammation is using the ice pack. That's probably my first move. Yeah. In those acute stages. Yeah, definitely. And we had that whole show that we talked about when to use heat and when to use, use cold um, in, in treating, you know, various sprains and strains and definitely want to use the ice in that acute stage so that it doesn't become chronic, doesn't I'm become chronic. your friend of me. <laughs> this doesn't want to stick around too long. You don't want inflammation drinking your beer and hanging around too long. <laughs> right. right, right. So, I mean, I, the other thing I, I, I might consider, um, I mean, I might consider using the laser. Absolutely. You, use, you know, in that early stage of inflammation, um, we, uh, I, th- I think that's yeah. the number one thing that, that laser, you know, can, can do it's, is control that inflammation. Right. And right. So many veterinarians are even using it, um, before the dogs wake up, um, right. on the operating table, you know, as, as getting a jump start on healing and controlling right. that inflammation. So, yeah. And Chris and I will, um, we've often, uh, um, because you can't always get to the veterinarian to get that laser treatment as often as you like during that acute stages. And we, we like to use home laser therapy um, that clients can can do with their pets at home. That's very safe and very easy. Um, and we oftentimes use the MedCovet Luma mm-hmm. um, because we can, can we can actually via an app monitor all the we we set the settings, we set the dosage, we play, we set where you want to where we want to laser it, and the owners can do it at home, and it's very safe and communicate so, through that app and communicate MedCovet. through that yeah. app as well. Yeah. So, uh, good tool for controlling inflammation. You know, yeah, very prescriptive, not just. Kind of letting exactly. owners, yeah, figure things out on their own. Exactly, exactly. The, the, the clinician has the control over um, the dosing and so forth, and then the owners carry it out at home, and it's very safe. So please take a listen to our podcast with CEO Alone Landa of MedCovet Luma to learn more.
what other kinds of things can we do to um, treat inflammation and, you know, whether it, it's chronic or acute um, that we may not be privy to so much? I think pet owners consulting their, their veterinarians in terms of medications, certainly. Right. So you have yeah. your steroids like prednisone and is dexamethasone, is that one? It, um, it, it, yeah, it's a steroid. Yeah, that is a yeah. steroid. That are, you know, used for different things. And then the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are a whole class called NSAIDs yeah. um, that I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with out there um, for, for their pets because they're very common, commonly prescribed, yeah. um, things like Rimadyl and Prevacox and Galaprant, but these would all come from your veterinarian. Right, right. And that's the important thing to remember that um, only your veterinarian can prescribe these non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or steroids. So it's so important that you get the right dose, the right medication. Some dogs do better with one medication and they don't do well with another. You never want to give your dog, your other dog's medication. It's really, really important. And it could be potentially life-threatening if you use a dose that hasn't been prescribed by a veterinarian or a medication that hasn't been prescribed by a veterinarian. But that being said, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are fantastic at controlling inflammation. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah. there are also cases where the pet can't take that drug. Maybe they have right. kidney or liver disease. And so that's where some of these other modalities come into play. And you said, don't give, you know, the other dog in your household, you know, the medication, but also you cannot cross between species. Oh, you know, dogs goodness, cannot no. take, no. cannot take our ibuprofen, you know, that no. we take. And you certainly can't give these things to your cats. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, it's very yeah. different in how they yeah. metabolize and what works. And like you said, could be potentially lethal. So absolutely. Um, there, it's only happened to me a few times, Chris, um, just a handful of times, but there've been times when we've been in surgery and there's been a lot of bleeding in the surgery and we, we can't quite figure out exactly why there's so much bleeding. And then we later find out that the owner, forgot, you know, didn't disclose that they'd given their pet an aspirin or had given aspirin for several days in a row before. Uh, so we never want to do that. You have to talk to your veterinarian ahead of time. If you're worried about pain management prior to surgery after surgery or for chronic, you know, so that's, that's really important. Mm -hmm. But that being said, there are also a lot of things that we can do that are not prescribed that are safe. We just did a podcast with Dr. Susnow um, from Companion CBD. Um, and I loved talking to him because he was a wealth of information, um, but also he was willing to talk to other veterinarians about cases and owners about using uh, CBD oil for things like gastroarthritis. Right. So their website has ask a vet as a right. component, which is, is awesome because there is a lot, you know, although you said he's a wealth of information, which he is, he's an expert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is still so much we don't know that, right. that he, you know, is very forthright about. Yes. yes. Um, and I think that's ahead. why it's, it's ask a vet is so important that these vets, you know, um, that we can consult with him directly, him being the, the, you know, an expert on, uh, CBD. I'm going to say oil, but I know that a lot of the things that they were using were were chews and so forth. But right. um, yeah, so we got a professional in our pocket, Dr. Sauce now at Companion mm -hmm. CBD. So we mm -hmm. should utilize that. And then our friend, it sounds like we're just plugging all our-, our I guess shows. so, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, our friend, Dr. Ennis, who was one of our first interviewees, uh, she's the first one. Uh, she has a holistic practice locally here. And she's the first veterinarian that I knew that was doing anti-inflammatory diets. Um, oh. But it's a thing. And- there is a mutual uh, client of ours, a, a dog named Clover, that uh, could not have cruciate surgery due to her her young age, actually, mm -hmm. and so was kind of waiting things out. And she was a you know young active dog, and and so I referred actually out to uh, Sleepy Dog Veterinary, and she was put on an anti inflammatory diet, and uh, I was like, wow, that's great because mm -hmm. I knew that her injury was causing a state of chronic inflammation until she had surgery. 
And that chronic inflammation is going to play in later in this dog's life when in the development of osteoarthritis, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we, we really don't want that. We really don't want that inflammation to get out of control because it's going to be a, a big contributing factor to osteoarthritis. And I guess the final category that I'm thinking of is, you know, we've really, I think as a society, gotten much more attuned with uh, supplements out there, you know, right. kind of more natural, if you will, but can be very powerful um, and quite effective um, for all of us, you know, people mm -hmm. and animals alike. So, you know, one of the things that, that I take every day is fish oil uh, for right. its omega-3 fatty acids, because those right. many studies have shown that the omega-3 fatty acids are quite effective in controlling inflammation. Right. And when considering fish oil for your, your your pets, you know, I think it's really important, Kathy, that that a pet owner gets something that is specifically made for their pet companion animals, you know, not uh, using the, the human version, because there are certainly proprietary blends out there that are formulated specifically for dogs, cats, and I'm sure other species as well. But, you know, I think that's really important to not guess and assume that, again, what works for us may not work as effectively for our pets. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, I think of some of the supplements, I think about uh, that how important it is actually for your dog to get a, a supplement that is made for canines. Um, one of those reasons is bioavailability. We've got to make sure that these these supplements are actually uh, working, that they're they're crossing that that barrier, and these animals are actually absorbing these supplements and they're working for them. And so, I think the other thing is in in human med in human supplements, I I wouldn't even begin to know how to dose my pet with my human um, supplements. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. so I think yeah, I think that's an important statement that that they should be formulated for dogs or for cats or for mm -hmm. whatever pet you have should be specific to their species. And some other supplements that I've heard of um, use are, you know, turmeric, uh, boswellia. Um, but again, consult with your holistic veterinarian or your veterinarian mm -hmm. period to determine if it's appropriate for your pet before you, yeah. you know, use Dr. Google and go on the internet and, and yeah. you know, try to, to come up with something. Do you have, have you heard of tea relief? Yes, I was just going to mention tea relief. I like tea relief. Um, well, and I've only recently been introduced to it, probably in yeah. the last maybe year or so. Yeah. So I asked our friend, Dr. Ennis, because I knew she carried it. And one, the specific question I had was, is tea relief easier on the organs, specifically the mm -hmm. liver, than your typical non anti-inflammatory drug? And without hesitation, yeah. she said much much. Yeah. So again, some of these things, if taken in the right dosage can yeah. be very effective, but potentially easier on, on the body. And this yeah. tea relief is made specifically for animals. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've been, uh, since, uh, Dr. Ennis in introduced that to me as well in the last year or so we've seen, I've seen patients using tea relief and getting pain relief. <laughs> tea relief is pain relief. Um, and then there's a couple of, there's one particular um, supplement that I like that Vetri Science put it out for um, pain. I think it, uh, well, there's two, there's Mobility Flex and Vetri Flex. Mobility Flex is typically given after uh, surgery in that time frame where you may be painful. Um, and then usually we oftentimes switch to Vetri Flex after that for long-term management. But um, again, bioavailability, it's their, it's the technology that they have in their product that allows for these um, supplements to be absorbed. Right. And, and that's what I was going to say. That's a fancy word, but basically I think of it as uptake, you know, can the body yeah. absorb, right. as you said, right. or take in that. I, I think there's a fancy word for it. It's like phytosome technology. I think it's a fancy <laughs> phytosome technology. <laughs> Talk about polysyllabic there. <laughs> So as we're kind of approaching uh, the, the end of the podcast, um, I thought we could maybe talk about some possible triggers for inflammation that, that, you know, maybe our listeners wouldn't necessarily think of. So stress can actually contribute to inflammation, whether it's physical or emotional stress. So Kathy, you know that I, I work with the rescue and foster cats. And we often see when these cats come into the rescue that they'll get runny eyes, runny nose, start sneezing. And indeed, what that is, is a herpes virus that is rearing its ugly head 
due to the stressful situation of, of coming into rescue, right? These, these cats are in right. a different environment. And even though in the end, everything's going to be much better for them um, at the time, you know, they're nervous, they're stressed. And so that's a trigger that sets off an inflammatory response to fight this virus. It's similar to, you know, when we've gotten chicken pox as kids, that's a herpes virus, right? right. And then we get stressed and we get a cold sore. That's yeah. the herpes virus. It's latent and that yes. stress brings it out. Yeah. It's hiding in our body. It's lurking. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, that herpes can cause in adults is shingles. Oh, that's and we one. know that that's definitely painful. That is inflammation, right? right? It's red. It's blistery. It hurts. So again, another example. But my point being that stress can be a very common trigger for setting off inflammation. Right. Good point, Chris. Disease, of course. Disease yep. always is a possible um, trigger for inflammation. If I think about just the amount of patients that I see for uh, dentistries, uh, and they have uh, dental disease, gingivitis, there's a tremendous amount of inflammation that's happening there in the mouth. Ooh, um, and you said itis. Oh, inflammation. <laughs> yes. So that, that makes me yeah think that we, we failed to mention that so far. So anything that has itis as a suffix means it's inflammation of that root word. Right. So, okay, let's do like a, a fast jam. Tendonitis. Tonsillitis. Tonsillitis. <laughs> um, uh, gastritis. Tendonitis. Um, I already said tendonitis. You said tendonitis. <laughs> Okay, I guess this isn't working. <laughs> That's hard. But anything that has an itis on it at yeah. the end, tonsillitis, tendonitis, appendicitis, Ooh, any of one. those things um, are, are inflammation of the, the prefix of the word. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep. And, uh, you know, you're talking about disease processes. Um, I was reading some things uh, specifically related to insulin and the ability to process insulin, or if your hormones are out of whack. I know like cortisol and, um, you know, different things can really impact, um, you know, inflammatory responses in, in the body. Um, there's also allergic reactions, you know, environmental mm -hmm. things. Um, okay. Like I've, I've heard of dogs that are allergic to grass. Like how awful would that be to um, be a dog Chris, and be allergic to grass? My what? dog is allergic to grass. See, <laughs> there you go. And um, I would say as a veterinary technician, one of the most frustrating of, of all things for clients is these allergies because the inflammation is difficult to control. Um, and then you've got to get on, you know, allergy drops or, or you know, anti-itch medications. Um, but inflammation of the skin is... Dermatitis. 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 There's another itis. And it is awful. And it's, it's hard to control. And it's very frustrating for pets and for owners. Um, my dog is also allergic to leaves. So... <laughs> We have every yeah. season covered. <laughs> yeah, really, really. Yeah. Well, and, and it could be cleaning products. It right. could be, um, you know, a lot of dogs um, will chew at their feet and oftentimes that is a food allergy. Right. So, you know, that's a whole thing in veterinary medicine now, you know, is, is mm -hmm. the dermatology department and namely, yep. you know, treating all these allergies. And the skin is the largest organ of the body. So, you know, if it's inflamed, that's, that's a big deal. That's, that's really, a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Really impacting quality of life there. So, um, I guess, you know, I also wanted to just touch on some of the, the, the you know, we talked about triggers there, but yep. some of the common causes of chronic inflammation. So early on, um, you know, I mentioned that if you have an immune system that you are going to, you know, get inflammation as a natural defense. But if you have an autoimmune disorder, and many dogs do, there's yeah. like polyarthritis. It, it's an autoimmune disorder that attacks all the joints of the body. And people, an example might be lupus. Um, yeah. But basically, the body attacks itself. The body attacks healthy tissue. It When you have an autoimmune disorder, there's a, a misfire, um, a misinterpretation. And the body starts to attack things that it, that it shouldn't. And right. that's just awful. So when we talked about it earlier about those white blood cells releasing those chemicals to fight off foreign invaders, um, they've, they've, they've picked something in the body that they've determined is a foreign invader, but it's, it's, but not, it's not necessarily mm -hmm. a foreign invader. But another 
cause of chronic inflammation. And, and, you know, sometimes these things just can't be escaped. I mean, if you have an autoimmune mm-hmm. disease, it, it's you manage it, but you may not ever right. be able to fix it. And another would be like exposure to toxins. Like sometimes, you know, people and pets live in an environment where, you know, there might be things in the soil, there might be things in the air in terms of pollution, there might be, um, you know, things in the water, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we're learning more and more about this all the time and the things that we're susceptible to in terms of these environmental toxins, so are our pets. Right. And they can lead to things like um, you might see these do- cats, particularly with these chronic like asthma things, so because there's something in the air that they, they're they filtering in and, and they have these chronic respiratory things from something that's in the air. Uh, so yeah, those are all, those are mm-hmm. all um, triggers. Factors. But I guess, you know, kind of the, the big take home message, because untreated acute inflammation, or if we continue to, you know, pick that scab, if you will, right. and, you know, delay the healing and continue to cause further inflammation, then that can lead to a chronic issue. You know, so infection and injury left untreated or neglected or um, that that I always tell my clients, you know, I'm like, yes, this is a rough timeline of when your pet should yeah. heal after surgery. Yeah. But that's barring any incident in the healing process. If there's a right. setback, then you slip, you fall. Yeah. Yeah. Then you're kind of, you know, yeah. starting over. That time frame is delayed. And so what should have healed in two weeks now is four weeks. What should have healed in four weeks becomes eight. And that is your your chronic inflammation. That yeah. that's the kind of thing that Kathy and I are dealing with all the time in our with our rehab. Yeah. Don't let inflammation uh couch surf for more than like three days. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. In front of me. So, in front of me. So what what would be some signs of chronic inflammation, Kathy? Well, pain, I think, is probably the first thing I think of. Because I, I think that um, it's when it's chronic inflammation, it tends to be more subtle. And so that's why I kind of wanted to alert the peeps out there about, you know, again, it could be like pain, yes, but like yeah. abdominal or chest pain, you know, not like the continued pain from your ankle sprain, mm-hmm. fatigue, oh, yeah, fever, fever. And it, and and in dogs or cats, they could be um, they hide or um, they avoid you or they're um, not eating or they're act or maybe even acting out maybe aggressively when they don't normally things like that. Mm-hmm. Again, your your skin rashes that we alluded to, mm-hmm. and early on, you know, when we were opening this podcast, I said, you know, I'm feeling a little stiff, a little achy these days because of the weather outside. That barometric pressure definitely impacts my arthritis, and it does the same for your pet. So don't ignore that stiffness. When you see those first, you know, signs, those struggles to go up and down the stairs or get up from the floor, that is a sign of inflammation of the joints, i.e. arthritis. So one of the top diagnoses for which pet owners seek veterinary help. Right. And worst case scenario? Diseases caused by chronic inflammation, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, cancer. yes, when we were talking to the tripods people, Mm -hmm. um, they mentioned nutrition and again, the the anti-inflammatory diet and things like that, the anti-cancer diet, all of that is addressing those components, um, Mm -hmm. you know, that of chronic inflammation. And you mentioned asthma, you know, with the cats. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's another disease that is perpetuated by chronic inflammation. Um, if you guys haven't had a chance to listen to some of our other po- podcasts that we mentioned today, uh, Dr. Sauce now with the Companion CBD, and check out the um, the podcast on when to use heat and, and cold, because I think that will also help with uh, understanding what modalities you can use in, in the stages of inflammation. And um, of course, go and listen to the interview we did with Alone Landa uh, on the Medco Vet Lula. So those right. are all, all all pair very well with this yeah. with this how podcast. laser works and and how it decreases inflammation. So perfect, good right. summary. So Kathy, do you have a final thought for our audience? I do have a final thought. I want you to think about inflammation as your frenemy. Okay, um, and remember that there is good inflammation that is natural and is a part of the healing process of the body, and then there's the inflammation that becomes. Uh, chronic 
And that is the problem. That's the enemy. That's what we're trying to control here. We don't want uh, inflammation to turn it into chronic long-term problems because they contribute to a lot of, they can contribute to a lot of diseases. Um, So don't let, like I said before, um, don't let, don't let the, don't let chronic inflammation stay at your house too long. That sounds like great take-home advice on many, many levels. So I hope you folks have learned a lot about inflammation. I know it can be a rather dry topic, but uh, we tried to add some levity here because Kathy and I love to geek out on this kind of stuff. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. This was great, and I will talk with you later, okay? Sounds good, Kathy. Bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to enableyourpet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.